It's Paulson's People with Eric Paulson. Good evening and thanks for joining us for a special program we call Paulson's People. A couple of things ought to be obvious by now. My name is Paulson and this is a show about people. Now if you're like most of us, you love to watch people. No matter where you are, here in the quarter or out at the mall, we all watch people. Doesn't matter if they're rich or poor, young or old, as long as they're interesting, we'll watch them. And tonight, we have some people well worth watching. In our first story, you'll meet a mentory man who's taken a childhood dream and turned it into an obsession. He's the ultimate toy train collector who owns thousands of trains. Then we'll introduce you to three men you see almost every day on television. They're New Orleans not ready for primetime TV pitch men. You'll get their real story. And do you know this man? He's a New Orleanian and an Olympic gold medalist. All these stories coming up next. Train set, and if you didn't, you probably wanted one. And except for the times you come out here to ride the railroad at City Park, most of us outgrow that phase in our lives. But not the man you're going to meet in our first story tonight. He's taken his hobby of collecting toy trains to unbelievable heights. He's an interesting man. How's the correspondence? Are we up to date? Dom Schwab is a man you might think hardly has time to breathe. He runs several businesses Bye -bye. from his Metairie home, is the coach of the Kenner Knights football team, the captain of a Mardi Gras crew, a member of the Crescent City Corvette Club, president of the Greater New Orleans Floral Trail, and is the curator of a museum. Now, you might think a man like this has an obsession to stay busy. Well, that's only half correct. Dom has an obsession, but that's not evident till you get to another part of his house. Dom, this is, uh, this is unbelievable. Well, it's welcome to my world. This is Dom's obsession, his trains. And he has lots of them, some 10,000 in fact. And you really don't appreciate this place until you look around. Besides this setup, there are walls and walls and more walls filled with trains. How many trains do you have here? Total in the attics and the closet, close to 10,000. How many are on display here? Mm, I guess maybe 4,000. You've got 6,000 hidden away in storage? Yeah. You, you saw closets underneath here and you didn't see the attic. <laughs> Just to get an idea of how big Dom's train collection is, you have to see his house. It's a large home in Metairie that Dom had to add a wing on to to house his train sets. The addition is a two-story, 3,000-square-foot wing that he really wanted bigger. Now I talked me out of it. Your wife? Yeah. Otherwise, you'd have had three stories of trains. They put the foundation, you know, when they come back here and put the pounds. We did it for three stories. Well, you thought you'd sneak it by her, huh? Yeah, but I decided I better not. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, everybody was looking at me as kind of nuts then. I figured if you'd have been on the third floor, you'd have been howling. In fact, while the construction was going on, he just kept quiet around his neighbors. I didn't tell what I was doing for <laughs> <laughs> I might have been in Mandeville with some other train fellow in French Run. And now what do the neighbors say? Well, they like to come over and look at them. They kind of smile about it. And they they, they uh, accept it enthusiastically, and they just look at it and enjoy it. Now, what do most people say when they come into this place? And I, I, I know our feeling when we walked in today was, wow. That's exactly what they say. In other words, they look at it and can't comprehend. Pardon me, boy. Is that the Chattanooga juju? Yes, yes. Track 29. Dom has thousands of hours into this setup and countless hours into accumulating his collection. He built all this himself, working on it for years, piece by piece, and is still working on it today. And when he has the whole thing running, it is a marvel, even if you're not a train lover. Pennsylvania Station about a quarter to four. Read a magazine and then you're in Baltimore. They say the price of the toys is, you can tell by the, the little sound in there, that uh, you can tell the difference between the boys and the men by the price of their toys. And the price of some of these toys would shock you. For instance, what would you think this blue boys train is worth? Try $23,000. That's how much one was recently auctioned for. Dom has never paid more than $800 for a train set. 
and over the years has run into a few bargains, like this one, one of six prototypes. Okay, so you bought it for 30 bucks, right. and, uh, and somebody told you what it was worth. No, some collector says, I'd like to have it as often as high as five, ten thousand for it, and I couldn't stop laughing. Why well, wouldn't I sell it? Oh, I'd like to sell it for I was going to say, why didn't you sell it? But then I wouldn't have one. Yeah, but you'd have ten grand. Yeah, what if I do ten thousand right there to go buy one and pay twelve for it? Then there's the Disney train he bought for about a hundred dollars a few years ago. Now he says the birthday car alone is worth four or five hundred dollars. And the list goes on and on. But Dom says it's not the money, it's the fun of collecting the trains. But he's made an investment that has grown more than any other hobby would have, and he enjoys it. But I've seen stamp collections. Stamp is paper, and with the autos they have today, they could, somebody could sit there and manufacture a stamp. Well, I don't think they can do it for a train so easy. And there's no painting worth millions of dollars like Van Gogh and so forth. And you can't play with that, can you? No, you just look at it and you don't want anybody to touch it. But no one can say that about Dom. He's a man his kids call Grandpa Choo Choo. Others may call him just the train man. In reality, he's a man who has taken his childhood dream to excess. Get a boy. Chattanooga, Chattanooga. And if you'd like to see some of Dom's trains, they'll be on display beginning April 1st at Kenner's Rivertown in the Toy Train Museum. Coming up next, some unlikely media stars, so stay right there. There's a lot of media attention these days on who does the best TV commercials. In fact, they give awards for them. But what about the people on the other end of the spectrum? How do the names Michael Hebert, Clifton LeBlanc, and Morris Bart strike you? Sure, you've seen their TV commercials, but do you really know them? You're about to get their real story. Is the lowest ever you've ever seen on all name brands. It is a Monday morning and Michael Hebert is going over the lines for an upcoming weekend madness sale. And even during a rehearsal, you can't miss his inimitable style. Well, we save you money. Oh, tell him to get my money. We have no money. <laughs> he is the man responsible for classic ads like this. We buy a Michael Hebert this week. We're going to get a free safety. And if you think he takes this seriously, the answer is yes and no. You start having some sequences from that point. Right. He and brother Ricky produced these gems on their own with a professional camera crew. They admit the spots lack a certain amount of professionalism and are quick to laugh at themselves. Prices are the lowest you've ever seen on all name brands. Check out prices in Saturday's Tom's Picayune. Come early, doors open at 10 a.m. No down payment. The no Bear family payment. runs this large operation. They used to own a store on the West Bank, but fire and other circumstances brought them here to Elmwood. And over the past couple of years, Michael's spots have kept people rolling in. And even though some find his ads crass or obnoxious, he doesn't care. Well, it means they're looking at me. They're watching. If they criticize, they're watching. They're supposed to criticize. It's good. It's good for business. And so you don't care as long as they remember. As long as they remember. Remember the address and the name. And I mean, because some people will go, you know what, that's pretty obnoxious when the guy goes, save you money. It's true. It is obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> but it keeps them remembering. Well, Michael Hebert saved you money! Money! And even on a tour of a store, Hebert is always selling. What you need to do, Eric, is uh, buy this set. Yeah, on sale for $21.49. $21.49, complete, table, six chairs, China. Originally $35.39. But on sale today for... $21. Because Michael Hebert... Saves you money. <laughs> Did you consider yourself like a huckster or whatever? I mean, uh, no way. I mean, because a lot of people think, well, look at if Michael A. Bear hawking himself on TV. No way. I'm selling. So you're just selling to a lot of people. Selling furniture on television. Now, now do you sell here? It's, uh, I mean, like walk out. No, I don't. I don't sell. So you mean that was a big privilege I got there. That was a privilege. <laughs> but not as big as watching the taping of one of his spots. He and brother Ricky run the whole show. Are we ready? Okay, stand by. Quiet! You could even get close to him here, Jim, if you want. Michael reads everything off cue cards while at the same time directing. Quiet on the set, walk around, mill around, no talking. Let's go. After a take, he asks Ricky if it's all right. Look good? Yeah, great. great with that action. Then comes the most important prop, the money. $200 in ones. He finds someone he can trust to hold it. Yeah, Michael, I'll buy you lunch now. 
gets in a few more rehearsals, and it's ready for the real thing. Van Elmwood, where Michael Abair saves you money! The dollars are all picked up. He's now ready for another take. There's a dollar right there. Grab it. In the back of you. And when Abair runs out of helping hands, he'll ask anybody for assistance. Eric, why don't you hold it over the uh, thing for me? Well, he gave me a buck Just to do this. Keep on and if you wonder why he goes on television, it's not to be seen, but to sell. Well, I'm not a star. I'm not trying to be a star. I'm trying to sell furniture. And uh, I'm selling furniture on television. It's the best way that I think I can get into the customer's home is let them see me. to me! I mean, you couldn't get, a, you know, like hire some announcer, some slick announcer or whatever, and he comes in and uh, they walk around the furniture store and go, hey, this is a nice couch. I thought of that. I didn't think anybody could do it better than I could, since I owned the furniture anyway. <laughs> but he hopes with ads like these, he won't own that furniture for long. The customers will come in to see if his catch line is really true. Well, Michael Abbott saves you money! <laughs> $2,000 minimum trade on Hyundai's. Yes, get $2,000. This is Clifton LeBlanc. It's not hard to tell this is no professional actor. He is the owner of LeBlanc Hyundai. And for the past two years, he's been hawking his Hyundai's on local television. Which gives us the best selection of 89's in the South. I don't try to some like his style, some don't. Most of the people love the commercials and they think they're exciting. And uh, I get calls that tell me we love the commercials. But we also get a couple of calls or letters in that say that we think that you're obnoxious and uh, we don't like your commercials. And uh, the, way I, the way I try to tell the people that call is you can tell. We just do the commercials ourselves because it's, we can do it for less money by doing it ourselves. Plus, we feel like we know our product better than anyone else. LeBlanc is a lot different in person from the excitable car salesman you see in his commercials. This 30-year-old bachelor calls himself a country boy who learned the car business from his father in the Baton Rouge area. He also learned how to do commercials from him. He and his father, Price LeBlanc, are legendary in the state capitol for classic ads like this. Dad, Price Wars getting really tough. Let's pull the pin on the competition and blast them away! that always end with this line. Now on his own, Clifton has continued in the family tradition, but has dropped the Dahlin line for the excitable sales pitch. Don't love Long Hyundai's first anniversary sale. Uh, you see, a lot of people say that I yell on commercials. But you don't I, I, I don't see it that I'm yelling on commercials. I see it that I, just, I get excited. Now, uh, everybody, I get a lot of people say that I do yell uh, on commercials, and. And I'm just excited. Uh, I'm calm. I'm, I, and some people comment, well, you're so calm in regular life. You're so calm. How do you get so excited? Well, it's just because you're on that commercial. That, that camera, just like the cameraman right now, is turning that camera on, it just gets you excited. And while others may try to imitate Clifton, you just can't match his style. Nobody else can do it better. Nobody else can do it better. How's that commercial say? Nobody. Here, LeBlanc, honey, we're going to carve yourself. Is that good? I think, you, I think you're a little much. It's more like this. Here at LeBlanc Hyundai, come get a brand new Hyundai Excel for only $89 per month. Get the best car and the best service only at LeBlanc Hyundai. <laughs> I mean, do you consider yourself like, uh, I don't know, pretty talented on TV? No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> do you consider me of being talented on TV? <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that, Clifton. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't consider myself being talented. I don't consider myself being obnoxious either. I consider myself as being myself and just uh, being excited. And whether it's Clifton Solo or working out with John Super D. Duplessis to beat up on the competition, this kind of advertising seems to be working. Sales are booming, and Clifton is thrilled to death to get to do the two things he loves the most, sell cars. Then you can also get power windows if you want that. See? Sorry, but I buy American. And, and it's less <laughs> money. And be on television. It's fun. It's fun. It, it's exciting. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of different. And, and it's, when, when the camera comes on, it's like any kind of little problem that you might have, it's gone. Because it's just, you're excited. And you know, he's right. When the camera rolls, you are excited. Here, LeBlanc, honey, we're going to carve yourself. <laughs> Is that good?
If you get hurt in a car accident, do like thousands of people have already done. Bring your trouble to me. He is probably New Orleans' best-known attorney, Morris Bart. He's been running ads like this for years. I'm attorney Morris Bart, and I'm on your side. And I'm on your side. And I'm on your side. The audience laughs while other lawyers cringe at the thought of one of their own advertising like this. But what Morris Bart may lack in peer respect, he makes up in success. He has the entire 35th floor of the Plaza Tower building. Bart is proud of his sprawling offices that house his law firm with a staff of 25, including three other lawyers. All built on the premise, it pays to advertise. Something that has not only made him a success, but a celebrity who gets, hey, that's Morris Bart, wherever he goes. That's exactly the reaction I get. And I love it. I mean, it's, it's fun. You can't really be on television if you don't like people and if you don't like dealing with people and seeing people and meeting people. And I love people. So when I get the attention, I'm really appreciative of it because I really love people. How much do you think it's cost you to become uh, New Orleans' most uh, known lawyer? Well, I've been on nine years now, and I, I couldn't give you an accurate amount. Just a ballpark. It's well into seven figures. Maybe a couple of million? Sure, I would think so, or more. And he says some of the lawyers who once turned their noses up at him with harsh criticism of his ads are now looking at him a bit differently. Because when I go to a seminar, a legal seminar, rather than the lawyers whispering or saying, well, there's Morris Bart, he's the one on television. Everyone comes up to me now and says, well, how are you doing it? How do you get an agent? How much do you spend? And even though more and more lawyers are advertising these days, none quite this flamboyantly. If you ride a motorcycle, look out. Cars don't give you any respect, and neither do trucks. If you get do you think your ads are good? I think they're very good. I think they're very good because they appeal to the market I'm trying to appeal to. And I have fun doing it. I enjoy doing the ads. But not everyone feels the same. While he may be proud of them, they do get to some people in a less than positive way, and not just other lawyers. And when I first started advertising, the public, I feel, was so shocked by it that I did get quite a few threatening phone calls back then. In fact, early on, I got several death threats, which I took... Commercials were that bad, huh? Well, <laughs> I think the, uh, the, the image I was projecting and what I was doing was just so shocking because people had never seen it before. We're talking nine years ago. But you can't argue with success, and Morris Bart has found that. He lives in a large Metairie home with his wife and two children, and both he and wife Kathy say they never dreamed Morris ads would have done so well, especially after very humble beginnings when the two were still dating. Well, the very first time I ran a, an ad on television, I was over at her parents' house having dinner, and all of us were very excited about the ad running, so right after we ate, we watched on televi television for the ad to come on, and as soon as it came on, I ran to the telephone and called my answering service, and sure enough, there was one person from the West Bank who had called me, and I got his number and immediately called him back, not thinking he must have been shocked. <laughs> To, to see someone on television, and one minute later, that person calls him up to see if they can help him, which was about 8 o'clock at night. That call, by the way, was not for some big lawsuit. The guy simply wanted help with a traffic ticket. Now, some might have gotten discouraged and dropped the ads after that, but Morris Bart continued, and the rest, the as they say, is history. Hurt. I've helped thousands collect millions. I'm attorney Morris Bart, and I'm on your side. It's a safe bet that most of us have hobbies, like taking the boat out for a Sunday afternoon cruise. Helps relax you and take your mind off the problems at work and the troubles of everyday life. Now, the man we're going to meet in our last story tonight has a hobby, but it doesn't relax him, and two decades ago, it brought him Olympic gold. Okay. If you get hit, uh, I could use about 3,000 and a half. It's another Friday afternoon, and Buddy Friedrichs, the vice president with the investment firm of Leg Mason Howard Wheel, is ready for the weekend. That doesn't mean he doesn't enjoy his work. He does very much. It's got high pressure. Well, the cost figures I gave you yesterday were accurate for the 1,500 shares that we bought. I think it was down 11 and 7 eight yesterday. It's a, cut to 11 a few minutes ago. And did we decide we were going to go ahead on that? And it's different every day. But this time of year, he can't wait till the clock strikes five. Sounds of the city pounding in my brain while another day goes down the drain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the five o'clock, the world and the whistle blows. I'm 
wrong. This is what Buddy wants to do most, sail. And it's something he does very well. I turn, 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 turn. Easy, man. He won a gold medal for sailing in the 1968 Olympics in Mexico City. It was the thrill of a lifetime winning the race and picking up the gold. But it's still hard to say which part was the best. I don't know uh, whether, you, whether when they put it around your neck or whether or when you cross the last, when you win the last race and you don't have to sail the, the second last, you don't have to sail the last race and then you put it through it, you know, too. I trim, 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 trim. Trim. Since then, Buddy on this boat, the Gauntlet and others, has won a long list of races. As you can guess, Buddy is not a pleasure sailor. I mean, I ended up only enjoying it when you know, out there trying to beat somebody one way or the other, you know. You get so competitive with it, but you just, and you do it so much, that it's just watching the water go by and trimming the sail. But I tell you, when I do cruise, they're always, my guys are always bugging me, because I'm always, you know, I always make sure the sails are always trimmed exactly right, and it drives everybody crazy, you know. Because I can't stand to see it not right, you know. And there is another sailor who understands that, okay. America's Louis Cup winner, Dennis Conner, who has sailed with Buddy and has a lot of respect for him. In his day, he was one of the very best. You have to be to compete at the Olympic level, and he's uh, been a great sailor with a fine career. And ever the gentleman, Conner skirts around the hard question. Who's a better sailor, you or him? <laughs> well, why don't you ask Buddy? <laughs> you know, Dennis has been spending an awful lot of time. We started out sort of even. And uh, we haven't really had a chance to find out the answer to that question lately. Obviously, Dennis has been spending all of his life these days sailing. And uh, I figure he's got to be the best in the world now. We're kind of more on a go to work from Monday through Friday and sail on the weekend type mode. Uh, there might be something we could get him in and be just as good as, but obviously 12 years, there's nobody better than he is in the world. Got out of town on a boat on the southern island. Sailing the reach for a following sea. She was making for the trades on the outside. And when you're a sailor with a reputation like Buddy, even on a practice cruise with your crew, it can turn into a race when someone gives you the slightest indication of a challenge. Then it's more than practice, it's for a win. A little more breeze, this guy's gonna be uh, pretty fast. I have my ship and all the flags of a flying. She is all that I have left. And we were constantly trying to get the most out of this, out of this machine. And sailing from a racing standpoint is very interesting because you always got to play the win, the win. Shit, it's kind of like a poker game out there because you nobody really knows exactly what the wind's going to do. You don't really get tired of it because it's almost unlimited potential. I mean, you just never can really totally succeed at it. But Buddy Friedrichs has come close. And even though he's just a weekend sailor now, out here, you'd never know it. Well, thanks a lot for joining us for a look at a few interesting people in the New Orleans area. And the best part is we've only scratched the surface. There are thousands of other people well worth watching, and maybe we'll get to some of those on a later show. Anyway, thanks for joining us for Paulson's People. Have a good night. On a boat on a southern island Sailing the reach for a following sea She was making for the trade outside and the downhill run to Papa Etig off the wind on this heading line the Marquesas you got 80 feet of a waterline nicely making